Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming to the talk. Uh, today we have Arman Kohan, a research scientist at the Allen Institute of AI and an affiliate assistant professor at the Paul, and, Paul Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering in the University of Washington. Uh, his PhD work at the Georgetown University focused on processing scientific documents and other forms of long documents. Um, he continues to work on improving representations for long documents and has made significant contributions in this field. Uh, my personal favorites are the hierarchical model for abstractive summarization of scientific documents, TLDR summarization of scientific papers, which is in production at Semantic Scholar, and the recent model, which is dubbed as long former, that enables transformers to process thousands of tokens. Um, without much ado, let's welcome Arman Kohan once again. Over to you, Arman. Thanks for the warm introduction and thanks for having me. Uh, I hope you guys are spending your last days of 2021 well. Uh, so glad to be here. Uh, let me try to share my screen. One second. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Cool. Uh, so yeah, um, uh, today I'm going to uh, talk about some of our recent works on uh, extending models for document level and uh, multi-document understanding. Um, so glad to be here and uh, talking to you guys about um, some of these directions that we're excited about. Uh, to give you a bit of uh, motivation, um, we all know that there's been a significant progress on token and sentence level tasks in NLP in uh, recent years. Uh, at the same time, we know that there are many practical NLP problems that require full document understanding. Uh, and there are some other tasks that require making uh, connections between documents or aggregate information uh, from within uh, the collection of uh, related documents. Uh, I want to also argue that if we make advances in full document processing, we will open up new challenges and application areas, both inside and outside NLP. Uh, but why, uh, why there hasn't been uh, too much progress yet on document level NLP? Uh, one of the main reasons is that annotating full documents or multiple documents can be difficult uh, because it requires people to go through the entire document and often make connections between different pieces of text and so on, uh, which can be quite expensive and difficult. Therefore, most of the existing, um, uh, existing benchmarks are sentence level or short context. Also, end tasks often require combining information that is spread across long distances. Uh, models need to ignore a lot of irrelevant texts and figure out which parts are relevant and actually connect them to each other. Uh, the other challenge is that many popular algorithms are designed to work with short sequences uh, because, um, for example, for older uh, RNN or LSCM models, and they process input sequentially and they can be very slow for long sequences. And transformers are also uh, not efficient for long input because self-attention is a, a quadratic with respect to uh, sequence length. Uh, therefore, many pre-trained language models are limited to 512 tokens. Uh, and models for processing multi-document tasks are often task-specific and complex. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, a few of our approaches in this direction. 
First, uh, I'm going to discuss a SPECTRE, uh, which is a model for learning document level representations. Second, I'm going to talk about how we can extend transformers uh, to make them efficient for long sequences, which is the long form of work. Uh, then I'm going to discuss how we can use uh, an extend long former for handling multi-document tasks. Uh, this is um, an encoder only model, which we call CDLM, and an encoder decoder version, which is a uh, primer. Uh, at the end, I'm going to quickly uh, mention a few of our rec recent benchmarks that uh, allow um, evaluating uh, document level tasks. These include SciFi, TLDR, and Casper. Uh, before I jump in, if you have any questions uh, during the talk, please feel free to interrupt me. Uh, I prefer the talk to be uh, interactive. Uh, okay, uh, so let's jump in. Uh, first, uh, I'm going to uh, discuss document level representation learning. Uh, this, this idea goes back to, I think, 50 years ago uh, that we want to represent documents in, to an n-dimensional um, vector space so that representation of similar documents are closer to each other. Uh, and in this work, we wanted to basically utilize transformers for this task so that um, we have more semantic information. Um, another property that we wanted uh, was uh, good document representations uh, should transfer well to downstream tasks. And we wanted uh, this to be without fine tuning, meaning that we wanted to be able to uh, embed or represent documents offline and then use these in downstream task specific models such as classification, recommendation, or search. Uh, so the Spectre um, model, um, the Spectre model's motivation was this. And Spectre actually stands for scientific paper embeddings using citation informed transformer. And, and the general idea behind the Spectre is that documents with links are more similar to each other than random documents. Therefore, we want their vector representation to be more similar. Uh, we, we implement this using a contrastive learning objective using the citation graph. So on high level, I'm showing um, a very tiny citation graph here, uh, where nodes are papers, for example, and links are citations. We know that, for example, here A is citing B, uh, meaning that uh, they, sh they should be very close to each other, um, probably farther away from something like F. And this, this is what we wanted our model to capture. So as a baseline, if, uh, if you're given a document or a paper, uh, the first thing you would do, you would probably pass it through your favorite transformer, let's say BERT, and you take the CLS representation as the aggregate representation of all tokens, and then use it in your downstream task. However, we wanted to um, add a pre-training objective so that uh, this representation is more powerful. Uh, for each uh, query document, we pair it with a positive document and a negative document. Positive means that it is more related to it, and negative means that it's not related. And then we use this triplet loss objective which basically um, forces the model uh, so that the distance of the query document and the positive is smaller than the query and the negative, and with some given margin, uh, which, which we set to, uh, set to one at the end. And we implement this using the citation network. For each, uh, for each training instance, we have a, a triplet of examples, a query paper, a, a positive paper, and a negative paper. First, we consider easy negatives. Easy negatives are just randomly selected negatives that are not cited by a query paper. At the same time, we found that adding uh, additional, um, additional negatives could be helpful for uh, improving the performance. And these are harder negatives. These are uh, negatives that are kind of closer to the query uh, document, but not as close as the positive that you're considering. 
And for this, use this heuristic um, of citation of a citation, meaning two hop documents. So uh, here are results. If you take a model like Cybert, which is birth that is trained on scientific papers, uh, and apply a specter objective on it, we can see that uh, the documents that are related to each other in the same topic area can be clustered uh, much more nicely than the Cybert version. And uh, remember that our goal was to have representations that work well across a variety of tasks. So we consider um, a whole suite of tasks from classification, uh, recommendation, citation prediction, and so on. And we find that specter embeddings are very powerful. And in general, they, um, they allow us to improve over previous state of the art by about three points, which is, uh, which is significant. And um, if you recall, I talked about these hard negatives. Uh, you can see here that depending on the task, uh, they can have a major improvement uh, between one to three points, meaning that like in contrastive learning settings, having hard negatives is important. Uh, one other nice thing about the specter is that uh, these are fixed representations. You don't need to fine tune them at inference time um, uh, or, or on downstream tasks. You can just take them, plug it into your machine learning model and uh, make it work. This is a nice property that uh, makes it practical for many, uh, man, for many applications. Uh, so to recap, uh, Spectre is a very simple um, objective function that allows us to learn powerful uh, document representations using citation network. And we can have a, even a strong zero shot performance on a variety of downstream tasks. And Spectre is currently an, an, in use at Semantic Scholar um, for many tasks, for example, for adaptive feeds and for citation ranking, uh, for recommendations, uh, and um, even some other academic search engines are using Spectre embeddings. Um, yeah, so uh, if, if you're interested, please uh, check them out. I think and, uh, the Semantic Scholar API also provides Spectre embeddings if you want, uh, want them for a paper. Okay, um, any, any questions about the first part before I jump to the second? Uh, okay, I have a question. Um, sure. Can you talk uh, a little bit more about the, the collection of documents that you use? Do you see um, a lot of um, discrepancies or imbalance between the corpora that you use? Does it perform better on certain types of documents than others? Um, yeah, but uh, what we used was kind of um, a sample from the semantic scholar data at the time. Uh, which, which is about like 80% uh, biomedical data and 20% uh, computer science papers. Um, the data sets that we considered were kind of mixed um, between domains. So we didn't have like a thorough investigation of performance by domain. Uh, but like in later internal work, we saw that uh, for biomedical papers, it works a bit better. Uh, and our hypothesis was that um, it's kind of because it has seen more biomedical data. But good question. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. If cool. I can ask uh, a quick question. Um, hi, this is Daniel sure. from SAP. Um, do you represent the documents basically just as a sequence of sentences, which are then again sequences of tokens, or do you use the uh, structure inside the document in any way. No, it's paragraphs, just paragraphs, figures, uh, all these kinds of things. So. I know it's just a flat sequence of tokens in the document that that is processed through a transformer. Okay, thank you. Sure. Cool. Uh, so the next part I'm going to talk about uh, long document understanding. Uh, a lot of NLP uh, tasks or language data consists of. Uh, long documents. These are like scientific papers, legal documents, even many Wikipedia articles are long. And at the same time, we know that many existing transformers like BERT and T5 can process up to only 512 tokens, which is significantly limiting. 
Uh, so uh, as a refresher, the limitation of transformers uh, is that uh, each layer in transformers consists of two components. One is self-attention and the second is feed forward. And the self-attention operation is actually the expensive one. Uh, it is a quadratic complexity uh, with respect to sequence length because every token is basically attending to all other tokens in the input. Uh, which makes it very expensive if, if your sequences are long. Um, so the prior work before Longformer, uh, the way that they dealt with long documents was basically the chunk extract combine strategy, where you chunk the long input into a smaller, often overlapping pieces, then extract information that you want, and then you combine it together using the subsequent layer. Uh, there, there, there were other like concurrent works on compressing memory in transformers and optimizing self-attention computation. But there were a couple of limitations with these methods. First was that uh, they only showed intrinsic value on language modeling tasks. And there, were, there was no like BERT-like model that you could actually use it in your downstream tasks. And the second limitation was that, uh, yeah, we, we didn't know how this actually worked down the stream. Okay, language modeling is an interesting task, but we, um, there's no uh, good study on showing how perplexity of language model translates to uh, down the stream tasks. So uh, in order to address these limitations, we proposed a long form model which is an efficient transformer model for long documents. It allows processing documents up to 16,000 tokens long on uh, normal GPUs. And uh, it, it's a general model that can be applied to various uh, document level tasks. So uh, the full self-attention operation uh, looks like this. You have um, a, a vector multiplication between uh, query key and values that are obtained from tokens in the sequence. And uh, the idea of long former is that instead of this full self-attention, we, uh, we have the tokens to attend to each other following a specific attention pattern. Uh, for example, we use this sliding window attention, which says that each token can only attend to um, a neighboring a neighbor uh, surrounding it. And the second um, attention pattern is a dilated sliding window. This takes ideas from speech recognition where, um, where tokens are allowed to um, attend to tokens with, um, with some uh, jumps between uh, immediate locations. This allows the model to have a larger receptive field. Uh, when you're stacking multiple layers, at the end, all tokens indirectly see each other. Uh, but while, uh, while you have like long, um, like long number of um, tokens, uh, indirect information flow is not always sufficient. For some tasks, we found that direct attention is needed. For example, for question answering uh, and classification, the way we process them right now using uh, transformer models is that uh, we tokenize the question uh, and then this is uh, like the document itself, we concatenate them um, in, a, in one sequence and process it with the transformer. We find that uh, in addition to the local attention window of long former, we, um, we need to add a direct global attention so that all the tokens in the input and the document see the questions. And for the classification, we want all the tokens in the sequence to see the classification token on which we add the classification layer. And uh, the self-attention matrix looks like this if we add the global attention. We have this uh, local attention window, we have these um, specific location where every token can attend to. Uh, and this basically is a task motivated um, uh, configuration. 
so so far we know that um, this thing uh, should work, but how do we actually implement it? Um, because efficient implementation is kind of challenging because it requires banded matrix multiplication. And at the time it wasn't supporting it in existing uh, deep learning libraries like PyTorch or TensorFlow. So uh, there are a couple of solutions. Uh, first is um, what we call sliding chunks, uh, where we split the um, self-attention matrix into um, small chunks uh, and mask out the extra elements. And then we get uh, the exact multiplication that we need. Um, this is uh, efficient because we are um, we are using still the existing deep learning libraries that are highly optimized. But at the same time, uh, it has some, uh, as you know, we are um, computing some values that we don't need. The second uh, implementation is writing your own custom CUDA kernel, uh, which is challenging, um, but it supports dilation. Uh, and it is a slightly harder to use because um, you need to compile your own uh, CUDA kernel. So here is the performance. Uh, the orange line shows a naive loop implementation. Um, you can see that on left, it is very slow, uh, but on right, it is very efficient. And the blue line is the full self-attention uh, that while it is efficient, um, in terms of memory, it blows up very quickly. But the sliding chunks implementation of long former is both fast and uh, efficient in terms of memory. Here are intrinsic evaluation results on character level language modeling. These are sequences of up to 32,000 tokens long. And you can see that on two, two data sets on base models, we got a state of the art at the time on these tasks. And these are larger models that are uh, at least uh, 100 million parameters. And at the time, uh, we, we got competitive results. The models that outperformed us used uh, significantly more parameters. Uh, so th these are all good. They show that, OK, there's some hope in long former. But our, our general goal was to have a BERT-like model for long document tasks that you can easily plug in your task into long former. So uh, we wanted to use uh, pre-training with self-supervision and then fine-tuning on end tasks. The challenge with this was that pre-training is expensive. As you know, if you want to pre-train at the scale of Roberta, you require a um, significant amount of GPUs, which we didn't have. So we needed to do careful initialization to avoid high costs of pre-training. So instead of starting from a scratch, we started from Roberta. Uh, and we found that if we copy the position embeddings of Roberta into uh, additional position embeddings that we have for our long former, it allows the model to converge much, much faster. And we did uh, mass language modeling on a corpus of long documents. Uh, so we did experiments on a variety of downstream tasks including um, Hotbot QA, Trivia QA, Wikihub, CoReference, and IMDB. Um, for some of the tasks, uh, we use global attention on question answering and uh, CoReference. For CoReference, we only used uh, local attention. Uh, we did fine tuning on downstream tasks um, for, for the base model, and we can see that Comparing with a sliding window Roberta based model, uh, we get uh, significant improvements for many of these tasks. For the larger model, we also compared with the state of the art at the time. On some of these data sets, we got um, significant improvements, while on some other, some other data sets like Hotbar QA, we got competitive performance. And uh, for, for some of these other tasks, uh, the better performing models were using additional information like graph of entities that long former didn't use. Uh, we further um, extended a long former to an encoder decoder setting where, um, where we use long documents, uh, where, where we wanted to process long document sequence to sequence tasks, such as long document summarization. 
here, um, if you have an encoder decoder transformer, um, what we did, we basically uh, took, um, took the self-attention part of the encoder and replaced it with long former sparse attention. Uh, and we didn't uh, change this on the decoder side because for summarization mostly, uh, the length of the sequence added output is short. So we didn't need to do that. The resulting model, um, we called it a long, long former encoder decoder or LED for short. We didn't do any pre-training on LED. We just initialized it from BART, which is a similar encoder decoder model. And we did the same trick of copying the position embeddings over extended positions. So uh, here are Rouge one and uh, Rouge two and Rouge L results um, for for multiple uh, pre prior work compared with LED. Um, LED is the right most two models, and we can see that we got a state of the art results compared with um, the Big Bird model at the time. And Big Bird uh, used a lot of um, pre training uh, and compute, uh, and LED didn't use any additional pre training which was uh, encouraging results. So to summarize, a long former was an efficient transformer model for processing very long documents. It achieves a state of the art results on, doc on, on long document tasks, uh, such as classification, summarization, and QA. And right now it is widely used by the community. Um, and if you, if you are interested, it is both on Hugging Face and uh, on GitHub. Yeah, before, before I move on to the next part, are there any questions about long former? Um, if anybody has questions, otherwise I have a question. Um, when you, um, you said that you add the global tokens uh, for the CLS token, right? But is that during the fine tuning stage or do you add it during the pre-training stage as well in some form? Uh, the pre-training, that's a good question. We, we only add it during fine tuning. In pre-training, we didn't use uh, global tokens, global uh, attention. Okay. Um, And, and um, what was the um, uh, pre-training data? Like, what did you use to pre-train? Was it the same as BERT or did you use scientific documents for this? We didn't use scientific documents. It was a subset of Wikipedia uh, with lar long, um, long length and uh, the stories corpus and the books corpus. All of them, I think, were used also in Roberta, but but we um, specifically chose it so that um, the input documents are longer than, I think if I'm not mistaken, longer than a thousand tokens. Okay, and, and um, does this work on short documents as well? Like, because it's always long documents that might have some performance difference with short documents. Uh, it, it performs similarly to Roberta, yeah. It, it doesn't outperform it, which we don't expect it to, but uh, in, in short sequences, it, it doesn't, the performance doesn't degrade. Yeah. Okay. But good question, thanks. Okay, uh, I'll continue. Uh, may, maybe we can continue discussions after this. Uh, so uh, third, uh, we want to uh, have models that can process multi-document tasks. Um, and existing work in this area often uses complex task-specific architectures for multi-document tasks. These are tasks that require uh, finding information from multiple documents, connecting this information together, and produce an output. Uh, most of these models uh, do not leverage the pre-training fine-tuning paradigm. Therefore, we hypothesize that and there's room for improvement on these tasks. Uh, therefore, we propose this model, which we call a 
cross-document language model or CDLM, uh, which is a pre-training method for using shared information between documents. And the resulting model is a general easy to use model for multi-document tasks. Uh, so there, there are a couple of main ideas for CDLM. First, uh, we, we, uh, we show that uh, pre-training using a cluster of related documents can improve results in multi-document tasks. And uh, we show that a pre-training approach to implicitly encode cross-document relationships can be effective uh, for downstream tasks as well. And um, to show you an example, uh, there are many documents out there that talk about the same event. For example, these are multiple news documents. Uh, all of them are talking about a musician who is suing a, a production company, but they are using like different phrasing and different wording. Uh, so we hypothesize that if we can encourage the model to use information from other documents to do some prediction on a given document, then this model is better able to make connections between uh, documents. Uh, recall that a long former can be also used for multi-document tasks in a simple way. For example, if you have a question answering task that you want to answer a question from multiple given documents, we can simply concatenate everything into a long, long sequence and then uh, process it with long former and extract the answer. Uh, so for pre-training uh, in CDLM, we propose pre-training on a, a cluster of related documents. For example, here we have two documents that are talking about the same event, uh, again, the same musician uh, who is suing the company. Uh, what we do, we do the um, regular mask language modeling where we mask out some tokens and we want the model to predict it. Uh, but what we do, we assign global attention to this mask token and everything else is local. And then pass it to long former and the long former should predict that this uh, mask token is, for example, in the word LH. And um, intuitively, this means that uh, the model can leverage this global attention to look at all other documents in the input. Therefore, it, it should be better able to make connections between documents. So in order to pre-train CDLM, we start from long former and continue pre-training long former on the multi-news corpus. If you're familiar with this, this is a multi-document summarization data set that was introduced in 2019. Uh, it has about four, 45,000 document clusters, each with ten, two to 10 documents. Uh, we train it for 25,000 steps. As you can see, this is, uh, this is a relatively a small pre-training corpus, and you don't need necessarily a large pre-training data to make these models work if you do a careful initialization. Uh, and at fine-tuning, we do the same. We concatenate documents and process them through CDLM. Uh, and for task-specific configuration, uh, we, um, we apply the same configuration as long form. For example, for question answering, we apply global attention to question tokens. And for classification, we apply global attention on CLS. Uh, first, uh, we do intrinsic evaluation uh, using cross-document perplexity. Uh, on the right side, it's the full CDLM model, and left side is long form. Uh, and each of these are uh, one ablation. For example, we can see that if we only use local attention, uh, if we use random documents instead of related documents, or if we put global attention on uh, prefix tokens, all of them result in inferior performance compared with CDLM. Uh, for evaluation tasks, we consider multiple tasks. One of them was cross-document co-reference, uh, which uh, basically we want to cluster together rel related mentions and events uh, into, into uh, their own. And here we can see that uh, CDLM achieves um, state-of-the-art results. I should mention that uh, some of these works are using a large size models, but CDLM is long-former base. 
and it is encouraging that even with the base model we can uh, outperform these works. Uh, for, for semantic document matching, uh, we see the same trend on most of the data sets. We are able to uh, significantly outperform state of the art, except for the PAN data set. Um, and finally, this is the Hopa QA data set. And again, we can see that compared with Longformer and Roberta, um, CDLM provides a significant improvements. So to summarize, uh, CDLM is a simple um, strategy for pre-training on multiple related documents. Uh, and the resulting model is a general transformer model that can work well for multi-document tasks. It's an encoder-only model. It doesn't work for generation or summarization, uh, but it eliminates the need for task-specific multi-document multi uh, modeling. Uh, Okay, remember I, I said it doesn't work for encoder only, but in the next work, we show how we can uh, make it work in um, generation uh, as well. So uh, the next work I'm going to present is a very recent work, um, which we call Primer, uh, or pyramid-based mass sentence pre-training for multiple document summarization. Uh, and the hypothesis is um, we can extend transformers for multi-document tasks uh, that concern generation and pre-train them to work well for multi-document tasks. Uh, here we focus on uh, multi-document summarization. Uh, just to um, just as a refresher, uh, this task concerns of having multiple input documents. We want to read all of them and generate a short summary of the whole. Uh, cluster of relevant documents. A previous, uh, previous work in this area includes uh, mostly data, data set specific models, which are either graph based. Uh, this graph based model requires domain specific additional information, such as discourse parsing, AMR, um, even information about entities, and so on. Uh, hierarchical models, which uh, basically use data set specific or customized architectures, and uh, they're hard to leverage pre-trained uh, language models. Uh, on the pre-trained generation models, there are general purpose models like BART T5. Uh, they work well on summarization, uh, but they require large amount of data to fine tune because the pre-training objective is different than summarization. And therefore, often they don't work well out of the box with a few examples. And the task-specific models, the previous one uh, was Pegasus, uh, which mainly focuses on single document input. Here, uh, we want a general pre-trained generation model uh, for multi-document summarization, which we call Primer. So uh, as an overview, Primer uses the long-former encoder-decoder architecture, or LED. Uh, and the input structure is just the uh, same as LED. We concatenate documents together using these document separator um, tokens and add global attention to these document separators. It looks something like this. For example, um, we have um, three different documents. We separate them with these, um, uh, with these um, tokens, and then uh, we add global attention to these. Uh, and we mask out some sentences and replace them with um, a mask token. Uh, you might ask, why do you, why do you think this uh, input structure of, of global attention makes sense? Uh, well, we did some ablation on it, and uh, we actually saw that this input structures helps, uh, helps the model converging. This is using uh, zero examples, 10 examples, and 100 examples. And you can see that um, the average root score and downstream performance uh, is actually uh, much better using this structure. And uh, for pre-training, our goal is to teach the model to identify and aggregate salient information across a cluster of related documents. Uh, we use the multi-document corpus news head, uh, which has about 360,000 uh, clusters of documents. And as objective, we use gap sentence and generation. Uh, and we propose this new strategy, which we call entity parameter. Uh, 
I'm going to uh, walk, walk you through uh, our approach. So um, the objective looks like this. Again, we have these three documents and we mask out some sentences and we pass them through the long form encoder decoder and we ask the decoder to generate the mask sentences. Um, this is uh, similar to uh, the gap sentence generation objective that the Pegasus uh, paper used. Uh, they select several salient sentences from the input document as a pseudo summary. Uh, and they hypothesize that this pseudo summary is actually um, a good, good pre-training objective. Uh, so Pegasus uh, experimented with three different methods and uh, the random selection, uh, selecting the first few sentences and uh, using a heuristic to compute uh, important sentences, uh, importance scores for sentences based on rouge. And they showed that the principal strategy works best. However, uh, their approach um, doesn't work well for multi-document tasks because our hypothesis is that uh, in multi-document setting, you have a lot of redundant information. And their approach kind of encourages the model to pick uh, pick sentences that are repetitive a lot. Therefore, um, it would prefer exact match between sentences. And um, to, to address this limitation, we, we propose this um, masking strategy, which we call entity pyramid. In entity pyramid, uh, we want to select sentences that best represent the entire cluster of input documents not just one of them. And um, it is based on the pyramid evaluation framework for summarization. If you're familiar with this, uh, this is a manual um, human evaluation framework that was proposed by Nenkova in 2004. And the idea is that we want to encourage the model to generate missing information using other documents in the input. So um, just, uh, just as a reminder, the pyramid evaluation framework works like this. We have a multiple gold human return summaries or references for each input. And then we ask a set of um, separate annotators to annotate what, what they call summary content unit, which are basically phrases or clauses in the summaries. Uh, then, uh, a weight is computed for each of these summary content units by how many references it appears in. Uh, basically, uh, if, if a phrase is talking about a fact and it appears in multiple gold summaries, it means that that fact is important. Here is an example. For example, there are four different uh, summaries written for one input. And uh, this is one summary content unit. Um, 1991 is another one. Uh, and so on, based on how many uh, reference summaries include each of these summary content units, this pyramid is uh, constructed. And top of the pyramid means that that information is actually very important because all of the documents are talking about it. Uh, so we take the same idea that was um, used in evaluation and applying for our pre-training. Uh, and and the, the idea is that the relative importance of facts in the input documents can be quantified by the number of documents it appears in. And because we are doing pre-training, we can't do human annotation. So we use entities as a proxy for human labeled SCUs. So uh, the approach consists of three steps, entity extraction, uh, building the pyramid, and selecting the most representative sentence for each uh, entity. Here uh, is a figure that maybe better shows this. Uh, for example, we have four documents. Each of them have different entities. We built this pyramid based on the frequency of entities that appear in the cluster of documents. Uh, we remove the entities that uh, appear only once. And then uh, based on the frequency, we consider each uh, entity and look at the sentences that um, this entity appears in. And based on um, 
these sentences, we um, calculate an importance score of this sentence with respect to other documents in the input. So intuitively, we look at the entities that um, are important and then select the sentences um, based on the information that exists in other documents. And uh, here is the ablation results on how this helps. Um, we can see that if you take the LED model, add the input structure, and then add our pre-training, uh, you get an immediate boost in the zero shot setting. Even using 10 examples, you get around uh, 27 average Rouge scores. And even with uh, 100 examples, you get to, um, to a reasonable performance. Uh, so we also compared this with the Pegasus principle strategy and we can see that um, our entity pyramid works uh, much better. And uh, this um, confirms our hypothesis that Pegasus is basically more suitable for single document um, tasks. So uh, in order to do uh, evaluation, we consider six different multi-document summarization data sets on, um, on three different domains. We also considered one single document summarization. You might ask, uh, how does this work with single document? Well, a single document that is long uh, can be considered as a multi-document task where each section is, is its own document. So we basically show that, uh, uh, we show that um, it works on single document, um, like a structured single document as well. And we evaluated this on zero shot, few shot, and fully supervised setting. Here are results on zero shot setting. Uh, and you can see that uh, the, the, the red color is uh, our method. And uh, on most of these data sets, it, it, it is able to achieve um, much better performance. These are results on few shot setting um, from zero to 100 examples. And you can see that um, the red curve, which is our method, uh, is almost always outperforming other, other methods, which shows that it is, um, it is effective for multi-document summarization. And even uh, in the full fine tuning setting, uh, meaning that you have all the training data, uh, you can see that the primer outperforms previous state-of-the-art uh, models, uh, most of them, yeah. Uh, we did also human evaluation comparing primer with LED and Pegasus. And we see that um, on, on most of the settings, it uh, outperforms uh, the prior work by um, in terms of both fluency and content quality. So the takeaway is that the primer is a pre-trained model for multi-document summarization, which is uh, simple and easy to use. And it is pre-trained with a new a strategy, which we call entity pyramid, and uh, reduces the need for data set specific uh, architectures and large labeled data. You can see that even with 100 uh, or 10 examples, you get to reasonable performance. And uh, it achieves a state of the art results on multiple data sets. So um, before I wrap up, I wanna quickly uh, talk about a few of um, our group's work on benchmarks. Um, I, I won't go to um, details. I just want to uh, make you aware of these data sets that are document level tasks and um, there are challenging data sets that might be worth checking out. So the first one is a uh, sci fact. Um, this, this is basically a scientific fact verification uh, data set. Uh, and this is a very relevant uh, data set um, for, for our current challenges because uh, we see a lot of scientific claims and we want to be able to uh, verify them. Uh, so a scientific claim can be something like this, the coronavirus cannot thrive in warmer climates, and then we have a research corpus. We want to see if, um, if the research supports this claim or refuse this claim. And uh, in order to um, build this data set, we basically use the citations. So we take citations um, in a paper, 
And then we ask annotators to write atomic uh, claims from these citations. And then we check the cited papers abstracts and see if this, um, this um, claim is supported uh, or not. Um, and this has a couple of advantages. It is a scalable because we're starting from citations rather than having the annotators to start from the scratch. Uh, and it focuses on important findings of the paper because other scientists found these important. And uh, evidence documents are also specified in citations. Uh, so the resulting data set is called SciFact. It has a leaderboard right now, and it has um, about uh, 1,400 um, number of claims. And uh, you can see that the annotator agreement is um, also very reasonable. The second data set I want to talk about is TLDR, which is um, summarizing entire papers into one uh, single sentence summary. Uh, and ideally, we want it to be different than um, different than the title. I'm not going to talk about our modeling contribution here. I just uh, want to focus on the data set. Um, writing a TLDR of a paper is often a challenging task because it requires um, combining information from multiple places in the paper. For example, here I'm showing combining information from abstract and drawing conclusion. Uh, so to do data collection, first we uh, use the open review data. Uh, we use the um, TLDRs provided by the authors. Um, and uh, in addition to this, uh, we, we use peer reviews. So if, um, uh, as, as you know, many of the peer reviews include a, a first paragraph that summarizes the paper. Uh, and instead of starting from a scratch, uh, we give this first uh, paragraph to annotators and ask them to write a TLDR from this um, summary. We find this to be much easier task than having the annotator to read the paper and write another TLDR. And um, I don't have time to go through the details, but there are some interesting aspects of how the uh, peer review TLDRs are different than author TLDRs. Because you're summarizing an entire paper into a single summary, there could be multiple aspects that each person is looking at. And um, these are um, interesting to look into. So overall, this is our data set compared with um, many other data sets out there. And you can see that the compression ratio, meaning the length of the document to summary is much higher than previous work. And it is also multi-target, meaning that for each, uh, for each input document, we have multiple uh, gold uh, summaries. And finally, um, if you're interested in question answering, uh, Casper is another data set that you might want to check out. Um, this is uh, also a naturally driven data set. Um, many of us, when reading papers, and we first look at title and abstract, and then we come up with questions. For example, we wanna, uh, we wanna know what baselines they use or how does this work compare with the other work and so on. So we, we mimic the same setting in construction of this data set. We ask annotators to look at title and abstract of a paper, write questions about that paper that is not answered by the abstract. Then we gave the same questions to a different set of annotators and ask them to read the entire paper and uh, answer the question. This data set was challenging as you can see, reading the entire scientific papers can be difficult. Uh, but in the end, we, uh, we were able to collect about 5,000 uh, questions. As you can see here, um, th these are the modeling results. We had a LED model. Uh, as a baseline, and you can see that there's a significant gap uh, between human performance and uh, the best baselines that we have. Uh, so this shows that these um, document level tasks are indeed very challenging at the time. So um, the takeaways from this talk is that uh, many practical NLP problems require full document understanding and ex uh, extending existing models for document level and multi-document tasks is challenging 
quite interesting. I talked about four different uh, models for, uh, for this task. The first one was the Spectre, document level representation learning, uh, long former, which was extending transformers for long documents, and CDLM and primer for uh, multi document tasks. And I also quickly talked about some of uh, our benchmark works. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for your attention. I want to also thank all my collaborators. Um, I, I will now uh, answer questions. Thanks.